Okay, we'll get started. Salam and hello everyone. My name is Jenna Hamid and I'm the programs manager at the Center for Book Arts. I'm so excited and honored to introduce today's program. This event is one of the programs organized in conjunction with Center for Book Arts main exhibition, Out of Sight, Beyond Touch, organized by Maryam Qureshi, featuring the works of Bahman Muhammadi, Shireen Salahi, Masume Mohtadi, and Amina Ahmed, all of whom you'll hear from today. We're also excited to have our special guests, Dr. Mark Patterson and Amir Parsa. We have two other programs we'd like to invite you to. The Hidden Library, an online masterclass with Shireen Salahi, Getting the Language in Our Hands, a collective conversation and intimate workshop reading on reading with Amina Ahmed. And if you're in the area, I highly recommend viewing the exhibition in person. You can go on our website to reserve a time slot to visit. If you're not able to visit, but still wanna experience the artwork in the show, you can purchase the exhibition catalog also available on our website. Support for programs like these are provided in part by New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Andrew Cuomo in the New York State Legislature and by public funds from New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this event will be recorded and posted on our website for, uh, for future use and, we'll, uh, and for those who were unable to make it today. We also have subtitles available, which are located at the bottom of your screen. You can ask any questions or share reactions in the chat throughout the event. Now I'll introduce the curator of the exhibition who will also be moderating today's event. Maryam Ghoreishi was born in 1983 in Meshhad, Iran. She received her BFA in painting from Tehran University of Art and her MFA in painting from Al Zahra University. She also received her master's degree in visual arts administration from New York University. Ghoreishi has participated in various solo and group exhibitions in Iran, Lebanon, Italy, England, Canada, and the United States and has collaborated with a number of art galleries and institutions in Tehran. Since moving to the United States in 2014, she has worked on numerous projects with several art initiatives, including Asia Contemporary Art Week in New York, um, Cat House Proper Gallery in Brooklyn, and Field Meeting Take Six at Al Sarkal Avenue in Dubai. Today, she currently lives and works in Brooklyn as an independent curator. Now I introduce Maryam Ghoreishi. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. I know we have people from different countries. So, and thank you for joining us. Uh, before I start, I want to mention that we have some of our guest speakers are from like they are in different countries, and we might have some internet uh, connectivity issues. And please be patient. We try to get everyone back again. Uh, just want to mention that. Uh, so for today, uh, we'll start with the artists, four artists in the show, Shirin, uh, Masume, Amino, and Bahman, to talk a little bit about their practice, specifically the works in this exhibition. And then we we'll continue the conversation with Amir Parso and Dr. Mark Patterson. And please feel free to post any questions if you have any comments. I try to read the questions while I'm sharing my screen to show you some slideshow while artists are talking about their work. So, hello Shirin John, salam Shirin. I would like to start with Shirin Salehi. I think she is in Spain now, right? That is true. Yeah, okay. So a quick uh, introduction. Shirin Salehi was born in Tehran, Iran. She's based in Madrid and New York now. She employs drawing, printmaking, sculpture, and creates artist books uh, using poetry as her primary source. Other concepts such as memory and silence are embedded in her, in her works. So uh, Shirin John, uh, 
you use writing in different languages in your uh, artworks, especially in the series uh, featured in this exhibition, Out of Sight, Beyond Touch. Uh, but regardless of the material you use, either paper or clay, it seems that language is an important element in your practice. Uh, we know that text had been used in uh, art in different uh, cultures during history. In many older examples, visuals and illustrations were used in favor of the text, but employing language as a tool in art, which gives words a central role, uh, flourished in the 20th century. But either in the older examples like Persian miniature, uh, miniatures or uh, medieval uh, illuminated manuscripts, or the recent examples where text has been incorporated into the artwork, such as, for example, Barbara Kruger's artworks, reading plays a vital role in the process of perception for audiences, and they are expected to read these uh, texts. As per your works, what appeals to me is that you put your audience in a position like by employing ways to challenge the act of reading as well as their perception through reading. So you, for example, in the works in this exhibition, you write with white ink on paper or just to emboss on paper. And sometimes you roll the papers or just cover them. Uh, so when I look at your works, I try to read, but at the same time, there are these barriers challenging reading and understanding. It's like by hiding or covering part of the text, you take the main functionality of the language and leave us with a fragment of the text, which I don't know, we can say it's just the image or a form. So would you explain more about the use of language and text in your works? And if we agree that there is a spectrum between using text as a tool only to convey a message like Barbara Kruger or work like visual forms uh, like calligraphy that we see the letters just as like forms. Where does your work dwell in this spectrum? And if you don't see yourself in this uh, spectrum, what is your approach to a language or text? Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, dear Mariam, Mariam John for the presentation. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say um, it's an honor to join you, all of you, in the discussion panel. And um, uh, for me, it's very interesting the, the concept of the, the approach you just explained about the, the inscriptions, the writings. Um, I believe in my work, the writing uh, that doesn't only stay in the spectrum because it's not only a visual work. Uh, actually, the works have um, an object-shaped form, so you can find, for example, references to the tradition as clay tablets or maybe scrolls, and ancient scrolls. So um, I think this is a very important point to start with because they are not only writings, but they are writings on materials who have a very uh, strong physicality because they're worked on clay or paper, but not as a bi-dimensional work, but as an object. No? And um, secondly, I would say that um, the writings that I rather call inscriptions, um, they, um, they, for me, they are a sort of sign or a trace of a presence of a body of um, more like a memory of somebody who has been in a specific place and time and has left that trace. So um, actually the content of the work, the meaning of the writings is not the theme of the work. I, um, I think uh, though to me that it's very relevant what I choose to write, what I choose to inscribe, for example, the works that are here in the in the exhibition, they are based on a poem by the Spanish poet Federico García Lorca, a poem that is very important for me, but uh, it is not my desire for them to be read. So uh, you cannot find, a, the message is not in the content. And at the same time, they are the words and the inscriptions, they are not aesthetical forms, like you said, like calligraphy, for example, mm -hmm. because 
I use them as the memory uh, of, of a time, of a past time, especially of a physical body of a person who has been there. And um, you very beautifully mentioned the idea of veiling, you know, which I use it very much in my work. Um, sometimes I use white ink on paper. Sometimes I use embossing prints. And um, in some works you can see Farsi, my mother tongue, that is illegible for the Western reader. Uh, in some works you find part of them covered with cloth or maybe prints folded and uh, hidden inside clay envelopes. So there's a concept of, of hiding, of concealing and veiling that um, I think what it makes that the, the language you see, the signs you see become more universal because you actually do not read them and do not get to the message inside them. And uh, here, what is interesting for me is that in our times, I think in the digital era, especially where, where I feel that there's so much overexposure in the visual culture and so much noise bound, uh, putting the, the covers, the, the, diver, the, the covers of, of concealment, the layers, that um, gives me maybe a path to have a more intimate approach to the spectator. But I need the physical approach because for me, the artworks are physical bodies and I'm interested in the, actually the physical relationship between our bodies, our spectators, and the, what, I, what we can also call the body of the artworks. Thank you so much, Siri. Thank you. All right, so I would like to uh, introduce Masume Mohtadi and my question is kind of the same as Shirin's question. So uh, Masume was born in 1983 in Esfahan, Iran, and she lives and works in Tehran now. Painting was Mohtadi's main medium until 2014 when she began her research studies in linguistics. In line with linguistic uh, theories and by utilizing different mediums such as artist books and installations, Mohtadi intends to challenge the absolute nature of language. Hello, Masume John, salam. <laughs> Hi. Hello. <laughs> okay. So my question, as I mentioned, I would like to continue our conversation on language and your approach to it. Uh, so in your work, you intend to challenge the absolute nature of language in comparison with Shirin's works in which the language's functionality is being challenged. You challenge like the conventional structure of the language, either by replacing this structure with an independent system, which are we can see in the origami artist books, or by dismantling the structure by cutting and interweaving the Farsi and English pages and sentences and books uh, in the second series in this exhibition. And what I see in common with Shirin's work is your intention to challenge the act of reading. In your statement, you write, quote, uh, here it is not a matter of being able to read and understand the origami language, yet of contemplating the content which is transformed page to page. So I would like to, uh, you to explain more about your approach to language, especially in these uh, works, origami books and the other books. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, hi, everybody. I really appreciate you all for attending today and a huge thanks to the um, galleries team and Mariam for curating this exhibition in the uh, most uh, professional way. Uh, well, regards to the questions, um, social interactions and human uh, communications uh, convert to my most important concern in the last few years. Um, and language as the best uh, element of this matter uh, become the main topic of my artwork and made me to be more focused on uh, linguistics. Uh, well, I agree with the result that words are the origin of misunderstanding. Uh, and I uh, often uh, find myself unable to convey the depths and the true meaning of my thoughts, uh, even in my own uh, mother tongue. Uh, 
Uh, we all uh, believe language as a complete and uh, unchangeable contract, uh, but uh, it's not true. Uh, in fact, uh, the process of communication uh, will be complete in our mind based on our previous uh, personal experience. Um, let me give you an example. If I say chair, uh, it might remind me uh, the chair I'm sitting on. Uh, but for somebody else, a uh, chair could be Kasut installation, uh, one and three chair. Uh, and uh, for another person, it could be a um, color of a chair or a picture or anything. Uh, then in uh, this way, I doubt the certainty of language. And uh, in order to challenge this sense of certainty, uh, I search for uh, an independent system outside the contract, um, contractual boundaries of language, um, and I found uh, and I uh, chosen origami um, in this cell. Uh, just as uh, in the language, unlimited words uh, are created from the combination of uh, letters. Origami is uh, developed by false. Uh, each origami origi uh, originates from a square, uh, and with each fold, a new object is created. Finally, I present each origami as a separate personally handmade book. Only those who are familiar with origami can read these shapes correctly. Otherwise, the reader will face sometimes familiar and sometimes unfamiliar forms of geometrical figures which change page after page. As we are not familiar with origami language, um, uh, as we are not familiar with origami language convention, everyone has their own personal perceptions without being aware of others' imagine. The metamorphosis of the forms in the process of developing the final object in origami inspired me to create my artworks based on international stories are written based on a metaphor, like blindness, uh, rhinoceros, uh, cow, and heart of, heart of the dog. The last but not the least uh, point is the concept of interwoven ready-made books of this collection. These books have the same concept um, behind the origami books, which is metamorphosis. Uh, for cre for cre uh, creating metamorphosis in this collection, I've made them unreadable with unique process for each book. In uh, another word, I've mentioned a simple idea in this series uh, of books, which is said every book is written again based on each uh, readers. Uh, let's talk about uh, books, uh, rhinoceros and blindness, which are interwoven together in my uh, last collection. I've cut the written line of blindness and I've woven it in a, a written line of rhinoceros. Then for blindness, I've woven the cut white parts of uh, rhinoceros with white uh, remind of each page. In this project, it was important that each uh, page be woven with the uh, uh, equivalent uh, page with the another book. For example, both page 13 together. In rhinoceros book, we have two uh, stories with metamorphosis concept in one book which none of them are uh, readable. Uh, we just see some words and sentences that developed a third new story in our mind, uh, which is very personal for each audience. And in blindness, there is no word to read, but uh, there is some familiar shapes that reminds different uh, stories for each audience based on their own personal experience. In book, The Heart of the Dog, I've woven Persian and English translation together. So we have a book with two translation, which it reminds us in the translation, we lost a part of conversation concept. Also, if audience is familiar with both English and Persian language, then she or he connect with more words 
and um, as a materials for inspiration and illustrating new stories in their mind. Uh, uh, about the other books and the <laughs> last books, Kao is a famous story in Farsi written by Saedi, which is not translated to any other language. But there is film uh, based on this story in the 70s, and it's screened at a Venice International Film Festival. I've woven this film script with uh, its uh, 35 millimeter film frames for uh, questioning the ability of written language uh, versus visual language. So doesn't matter if you can or cannot read Persian, you kind of get a general idea about the story. Well, thank you all for being here today and uh, taking the time to patiently listen to my uh, ideas behind my books. Thank you, Maestume. Of course, we will talk more about your books, especially the origami ones, when we want to talk about like online exhibitions and our tactile experience, because these are one of the cases that I think even if we show all pages, it's completely a different experience when we see them and touch them and see like these forms changing page by page. And I'm sure we will get to back later, to that later. Okay, so Amina John, hello, salam. Salam, salam, Aziza. Hello. hello. Okay, so it quick uh, introduction to Amina Ahmad. She was born in East Africa, grew up in England and has lived in Iran and the US. She specialized in Islamic and traditional arts and the, at the Royal uh, College of Art. Physically and spiritually, her drawings are grounded in the practice of geometry, continually referencing geometry in nature. So Maestume talked about reading and like the act of reading. I want to uh, continue with that and delve more into reading and the tactile interaction with your books. In the lack of sensory stimulus by the sense of sight, we experience the act of reading through the sense of touch while touching the embossed books in sealed cases. Uh, for people who hasn't visited the exhibition, these embossed works are presented in sealed cases, so visitors can just touch the work and uh, they cannot see it. So our perception is more built up in the experience of tactile interaction with Amina's books, rather than seeing you through the sense of sight. But we can still say that we read Amina's artist books, although there is no text in them. Would you tell us more about your approach uh, to perception through the act of reading? And what does a book mean to you? What is the relation between the book and reading? Thank you, Mariam Jan, and thank you to the Center for Book Cards for this uh, wonderful exhibition, uh, for giving us this opportunity um, to work together in this way. Um, those are wonderful questions, and I'm not sure if I can add any more to Shirin and Masume because they seem to have covered everything really, uh, and so beautifully. Um, what, first of all, I'd like to just uh, go back to the idea of text and uh, what is text, but something that is woven, and with regard to perception. <laughs> Um, what is perception, but grasping and, or trying to grasp uh, something and understand it. So then what is perception of reading, but grasping for something that is woven? And when I reference weaving or something that is woven, I'm also thinking about the, our connectivity, how we are all with uh, within our bodies, uh, the threads by which we are all linked and connected together. And the book for me is, in, in making the book, is really the end product. And it's the passing on of the book um, from one hand to the other. Touching a book gives a sensory embodiment of revelation. 
And the idea of revelation for me, um, having studied traditional arts uh, and also sacred geometry or looking at it also references uh, Mary um, giving birth to the book as a symbol. Um, revelation revealed layers. And I think Shirin also, also mentioned the idea of failing, um, revealing. And I think this, uh, this exhibition might also um, help further understand the idea of uh, veiling as well by this, the, the very act of a book that is hidden um, and then giving uh, the audience the ability to participate or collaborate in reading the book uh, or um, seeing the book, I would say as well, not just reading the book, but seeing the book uh, and embodying that, uh, uh, that feeling that they might then have trans uh, transmitted through touch. Now, a book, <laughs> that's a good question. And I liked what Shirin said uh, about uh, a, a scribe. And I believe that a book is something that is written or scribed um, that which is an inscription or written is composed of marks drawn or etched, uh, engraved, um, a skin uh, bound together, um, marked, a thing that a thing that is waiting, waiting to be touched, a thing that needs to be held and passed on from one one hand to another. Uh, as well, um, getting our, getting the language into our hands, basically. Um, and I think that leads me to the relationship between uh, reading and writing, and the relationship is is really about literacy and what it means to be literate and I have to remind myself that I'm right now, I'm speaking in English and it's not my native tongue. Uh, I come from an oral tradition and how do we read that? Um, how, uh, you know, when we have uh, a, lar a, a large amount of people in this world who are not what we call literate, um, how does how do we address reading in, in that um, context? Um, to be able to read and reading today is about comprehension, assessment, grasping again, um, the passage, uh, you know, grasping the passage, uh, the transition from one passage to to another, as well. Um, yeah, and what is, uh, you know, what is, again, you know, we go back to perception as well, um, but grasping, um, I think I would, I would like to leave it at that, you know, being able to grasp and hold on to something. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aminata. Thank you. Yeah, so for Amina, as uh, you saw that video, after you have this physical interaction with the books, there are some notes that uh, you can, uh, if you visit the gallery, you can respond to that, either by writing, drawing, whatever. And Amina will use that in the collaborative workshop that she's going to have in March 28th, 25th, sorry. Yeah, the one just kindly put the link there. Okay, so we'll go back to that uh, tactile experience about your works later for sure. Okay, so let's uh, go to the last uh, artist, Bahman Mohammadi. So Bahman, Salam Bahman, hello. You here? Hello. You're mute. Hello, Salah. Hi, everyone. 
thank you, Maryam. Thank you, sure. uh, Center for Book Art team. Uh, well, let me start by talking. Let about... me. Can I just do a quick introduction, and then? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So Bahma Mohammadi was born in Hamadan, Iran. He is based in Tehran now. He uses various mediums such as drawing, painting, and mixed media. His works are focused on human-related matters such as birth, training, social constructions, and evolution. And he encourages the audience to rethink and reconsider these topics. So uh, let me so we talk about like writing, reading and language, but I want to ask you about the book, why language takes reading and writing usually uh, associated with the book, your approach is different in this series featured in this exhibition. And uh, so we know that these are wood blocks. I will share my screen again and show you the images that look like books and might uh, trigger the visitors to flip the pages. And actually visitors are allowed to touch the, his works uh, at the center, at the gallery. Uh, so they look like book and that's why I call them like book-like objects. Uh, yeah, you make these pieces as self-portraits by painting on these wood blocks, uh, exposing them to sunlight and different temperature and putting them in water and all this within a four to nine, 10 year period. And uh, in this series, you refer to the process of evolution. In your statement, you write that, quote, under the influence of various factors, there is a possibility that I could have either evolved into what I, or we can say human um, right now or any other species. And you write like uh, a handless, legless, brainless creature with a tail or a handless, brainless, tailless creature with a hand or, and we go on. So, I would like to ask uh, ask you about the like you know, the making making process and also why the book, why they look like book. Well, well, let me start by talking about the the idea behind this series. Uh, Proteus and self portrait is the series including various works such as this work as you uh, probably see. Uh, and different painting on canvas, wood, and also on photographic uh, papers. I experienced a lot within uh, that time, and uh, they are all about evolution. Uh, that was in 2009, 2010, when I started reading a book, Das Riste der Menschwerdung, by a German author. Uh, actually, I'm not sure about the and name in English, but uh, I think it is uh, translated into uh, unbecoming human. Uh, well, uh, I started reading this book about uh, human evolution and I was so impressed and, uh, and uh, inspired by that, uh, by its influence on how we view the world. Uh, uh, back then, the book Homo Sapiens by Noah Harari, uh, with that um, uh, hadn't been published, hadn't been published, and I think hadn't even been written yet. So the interdisciplinary approach to this matter uh, wasn't as popular uh, as today. Uh, during that time, I got so involved involved with that uh, theory and uh, and the story of evolution told by the author. Uh, and I started to research about human evolution and its influence on, uh, on other fields of study. Um, but I felt that researching and reading is uh, not enough for me. I felt like uh, I needed to do something. And I ended up making these pieces and working on this series uh, in my studio. Uh, I usually, uh, I usually uh, generally avoid using uh, theories as a starting point to make art. I mean, uh, painterly experience has been the first step for me. But at that time, 
uh, but that time was different. Uh, this series uh, is not only my art practice, but as an uh, artistic outcome of my uh, research around a specific topic. Uh, I would say I was so excited uh, uh, that reading wasn't uh, enough and I wanted to contribute something and wanted to uh, add something. And that's why uh, I changed uh, my studio uh, somehow to a laboratory and started to uh, different experiments. Uh, the first one were uh, self-portraits, uh, which are mixed media on uh, photographic paper. And the uh, process is similar to uh, analog photographic development. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, also in uh, digital photographic development, I don't know. Uh, I mean, working under red light, like a dark room, uh, I employed a photographic process. Uh, such, a, such as developing and uh, uh, fixing to add an evidential and uh, documentary aspect to my painting. I wanted to uh, turn my imagination and also my personal experience uh, that I had in uh, my studio, uh, actually in my lab studio into a visual uh, scientific report. Uh, I wanted to make them, make them uh, believable, like, uh, like they are not man-made objects. Uh, I had the same approach to these wood blocks, self-portrait, I called them fossil uh, book uh, or uh, fossil book. Uh, to me, these fossils are more than just uh, artwork, are, uh, they are uh, scientific evidence, a documentation of uh, something uh, the same as photographic experience. Uh, I like to produce something like fossils by following the evolutionary path. And that's why it took about four to 10 years to make uh, these pieces. Uh, as you mentioned, well, I, uh, well, I painted uh, on these wood blocks and put them, uh, uh, actually exposed them to sunlight, uh, water, uh, uh, and different temperature within that four to 10 years process and transform them from wood blocks to something like fossils. Now in my studio, uh, I have some new versions in a couple of uh, buckets and uh, I wish you could visit my studio in Tehran. Uh, <laughs> uh, can I, I just want to interrupt you. So th this video that I'm sharing with you, Bahman sent it to me recently. This is, uh, the, I think these are the new ones. And I see something, I don't know what are these, like frogs or what? <laughs> I see something in these buckets. I think I, I think there are frogs, <laughs> but I have no idea where they came from or uh, how they have uh, been born. Uh, okay, uh, so these woods, uh, these wood blocks have been transformed to something like books, which is again associated with science and a book where the initial idea of this series had been started from. Uh, I mean, I began with a book and I ended up making this book like object. But uh, of course I wasn't planning to transform these blocks into uh, books, but it just happened. And I thought that's it. Uh, uh, and uh, we read, uh, read and discover uh, all these evidential theories in books. And this resemblance uh, became so relevant and meaningful to uh, me. Uh, just it. Thank you. Thank you, Bahman. So this is the video of one of Bahman's work at the exhibition. As, as, you, and as you see, you can actually have these physical interactions with, the, with these books. So 
Before we go uh, and continue the conversation with Amir and Mark, I would like to show some images of the reading section, reading room that we designed for this exhibition. So let me just share. So uh, reading room, this is a sculpture, The Bird in Love, and the artist is Ram Yarwala. And we have some books, some of them, uh, This the, the book that Bahman was talking about, the Farsi translation is here. And there are some other books that either I or the artist use uh, in their practice or some other books that are related to this concept of uh, like uh, tactile experience or book art, artist book. And I wanted to show you this. So if you could visit the center, this is out of the main gallery, but you can see this piece, this beautiful piece with these books in it. Okay. So if anyone has, uh, I don't see any questions so far here, but if anyone has questions, uh, maybe nothing now. So maybe we can just continue our conversation or if any of the artists would like to talk more or ask any questions. Nothing yet. Okay, I would like to continue this uh, conversation about like the book and we are all talking about this like physical interactions, we read books, what is the experience of us and we know that these years we see more like ebooks, digital books, what is the book now, what does it mean to us and do we miss anything by replacing this like book, like the physical book with ebooks using just monitors and screens to use the book? And I think this is very related to what Amina John said about like touching the books and the memories and all that. So if anyone wants to jump in, please feel free. Otherwise, I don't know. Uh, maybe Amy, do you want to talk about this more? Because I know that uh, you specifically work on this sure. topic. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you, Marianne. First of all, thank you also to the Center for Book Arts, for Marianne, for all the artists, for the amazing work and, and being part of this. This is really great. Um, just a few things come to mind, you know. So one thing, um, you know, Marianne, you mentioned the book and the future. Everybody's very, always very interested in the future of the book, right? <laughs> Um, and of course, nobody can tell exactly what the future is, but I think there's a lot of anxiety, um, for, especially for the regular reading practice, right? There's a lot of anxiety around the shifts that we're experiencing in going from regular printed books in, um, you know, in uh, printed and distributed in very particular ways to almost every dimension, every aspect of that chain of experience being challenged, right? So the fact that you could actually write whatever you want and disseminate it to your followers or disseminate it um, online in digital format to millions of people and bypass any type of entity in the middle, whether it's a publisher or a gallery or whatever. So everything has shifted, you know? And what's interesting to me uh, both in my own in my own practice and um, just in general in terms of how we're responding is how from the conception of a piece that might appear in a book or as a book to the way that that is produced, the material that is produced, the way that is distributed or disseminated, whether it's one single artifact or 500 or 2000 or 50,000 if it's a mass product, um, I think this is actually extremely interesting and extremely challenging. I think what we come up with is a lot of anxiety, especially for people who are really um, attached to the experience of having a very particular experience of the book, right? Um, and, and I think what can happen is a lot of overtures, a lot of possibility. And I'll take an example um, that's come up here. You know, I love when um, Shireen and Basume were both talking about um, both language and how you experience language and also the the fact of reading, right? The experience of reading. So, you know, my own experience is that I, I kind of uh, grew up as, as a writer, right? And I put it in quotation marks now because that is also changing. Like, what is a writer? What is a poet, et cetera? Um, and along my path, just working in different environments and, and 
you know, um, doing things more in a more material way, sculptural way, and more um, hand uh, ways, and just working in different places, I got connected more to the book as an art form, right? The artist's book, or the singular book, or, or the touchable, or the tactile book, etc. And I think what can happen um, is that those intersections can become much more, um, I don't know, much more enriching and, and, and create a lot of possibilities. Like, so for an example, uh, for example, when Shireen was talking about the books that she's constructing, right? And they're single artifacts, they're single artifacts based on text. I think that in our culture, we think of the writer as someone who writes texts that are then printed black ink on white pages produced in some sort of book format, right? That's what literature is. And, is. and is then disseminated to a certain extent through whatever mechanism we have at that time. But um, I think that writerly folks can actually begin to do that. And, you know, I've myself, I've been doing this for 20 some odd years, which is to actually think of all those dimensions, the number of artifacts, the materiality, but through the lens of the writer, right? So you write an original text that you produce maybe in three different ways, and then you don't disseminate them, you place them and intervene in the space that's reserved for art, right? Um, and I think this kind of intervention and disruption may be um, sort of where the vanguard of literary works can go, right? In terms of thinking of every single dimension of that and challenging or thinking about the reading process, which is obviously um, so central to the literary um, artifact, right? And then the reverse can become true also, how you can think of text and artist book, et cetera, more not just as artworks, but as literary constructions, right? So I just gave one example, but there's tons of tons of possibilities there. And I'll just finish there. And I think we are, in many ways, there's a lot of subcultures and a lot of niches, right, of experiencing different things. So I think the anxiety associated with what happens to the book as we know it. And you know, if you're a writer, then this is how it happens. If you're an artist and your artist book, this is what happens. I think it's much better to overcome and forget about the anxiety and just explore a lot, recognize that there's gonna be niches and then really create new categories. You know, We just have the artist book as a category. We could have the poet's book as a category, the literary book as a category. You know, There's so many possibilities associated with the book, the reading phenomenon, all the operations that can go on it, that can go beyond just the artist book. So, um, and I think that's very exciting for the book and for the and for reading. Thank you, Amija. Thank you. Sure. I want to take some words from you, like materiality, mm -hmm. anxiety, <laughs> and the future. And then I want to pass this to Dr. Mark Patterson, materiality and. What are we losing if we we see like this huge shift, especially after pandemic, like online exhibitions, online online events? Uh, it's not necessary. I mean, we don't have any other choices if we want to keep up our practice. We have to do that. And for events, I think it's actually good. That's why we have Masoud and Bahman from Iran and Shirin from uh, Spain and Dr. Mark Patterson. So this is nice. But about online exhibitions. And what, what do you see like in the future, if we have all these online exhibitions, what do we lose or what do we gain? So as Amir Jan said, we can just uh, not be anxious and just see what's, what's going on, uh, what's gonna happen. But for me, it's, it's, I would say this is my personal, uh, I don't know, feeling or something that I always think that, of course, it's easier to have, I don't know, just the ebooks, just have the ebook and read everything. But always I'm like, what am I missing here? Or is there anything that I'm missing or no? It doesn't matter. It's just the content I'm reading. What, uh, why is that even important? So I want to ask Dr. Mark Patterson to explain more because I know you've uh, like had a lot of research about technologies, haptic technologies and the sense of touch. So 
I would like to start with that. And would you start, I mean, as, but when we talk about the sense of touch, the first thing comes to our mind is like the uh, physical touch, like through the skin, which uh, cutaneous form, if I'm right. So I would like to, I would like you to explain more about what is the sense of touch in general? What are we talking about when we say the sense of touch? What is beyond that physical interaction? Yeah, that, that's quite a lot of questions all at once, Mariam. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have time. <laughs> yeah. um, so actually, this has been absolutely fascinating. And I mean, um, with the opening of the exhibition, it was just fantastic to see, you know, to kind of walk through like virtually with the camera and actually like see all the different exhibits, um, you know, see. Um, and I think if you're going to curate uh, COVID-19, um, Mariam, maybe, you know, you've got ambitions as an independent curator. And if you're going to curate COVID-19, it would be uh, not uh, out of sight, but only sight beyond touch. I think that's pretty much where we're at uh, kind of thing. You know, it's been screens, 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 more screens, right? And just the visual and just this kind of constant stimulus and kind of fatigue and um, yeah, kind of uh, sight fatigue, I guess. Um, and talking, I suppose, too. Um, but just to go back to your question, really, uh, and take it a bit more seriously, <laughs> uh, there is, uh, earlier on, with, when Amina was talking about grasp and grasping, and of course, uh, haptein, the Greek word from which we get haptic, is actually, you know, it's to grasping uh, or to fasten, you know, to attach things together. And so when you talk about the book and, and weaving pages together, uh, threading, you know, literally, you know, threading the books and how books were made historically and so on, and with vellum, with skin uh, as well, historically too, and then the illustration and the text and so on as, as this kind of historical formation, you know, we're kind of losing sight um, or, sorry, um, we're, well, we're losing the sense actually that, that this is uh, almost like a metaphor for how we touch in the first place anyway. So touch um, the first thing that we think about, as Marianne was saying, actually, is, you know, it's cutaneous, it's still with the skin, and that's not really how we experience touch at all. You know, that's, you know, touch is an amalgam. It's a, it's a thing that grasps um, or grabs a whole different set of, of receptors uh, in the skin, you know, to do with, um, so there, yes, there is pressure, like mechanoreceptors, there's also temperature, um, and also uh, proprioception, so the the bodily position in space as well. So when you're walking and moving and turning pages over, it's you know there's a, a kind of form of touching which isn't actually just how we think of as touch. It's it's something much more than that. So I think touch as a concept is wholly inadequate to the kind of things that we're talking about here, which is a book about turning the page. Uh, in Masume's um, origami work as well, it is almost architectural. I mean, I don't read origami because I haven't been exposed to origami and I don't know the rules of origami. So I can't see the patterns and the shapes in quite the way that she does and other origami practitioners might do. But when I look at somebody else turning the pages, uh, it is it's a different uh, pattern at each time. And there's a different carving out of the space, which is kind of sculptural and architectural as well. And it reminds me very much of actually the kind of um, walking around a sculpture or walking around a building, which is also a kind of touching with the eyes. And so there's this kind of idea in art history um, of you know the, the way that the senses competed against each other, you know, with uh, Lacoon and, and so on. Um, and uh, Herder as well, you know, on uh, Das Plastique, the, the book on sculpture too, which is kind of, you know, uh, kind of looking from the 17th century at how the senses relate to each other. And I was also thinking, you know, back to the idea of tapestry and weaving and threads that uh, Michel Serre, the, the French philosopher uh, who wrote the book, uh, The Five Senses, Le Cinq Sons, uh, he, there's an episode in that book where he talks about the, the tapestries at Cluny at the Museum in Cluny in Paris. And there's, there's a, a metaphorical tapestry of the five senses. And Serres says, well, of course, it, you know, it's about the five senses on the front, but when you go back behind the tapestry, you're seeing actually how all the different threads are connecting up. You see the kind of the real picture. 
And, you know, he makes some kind of comparison with the nervous system. And I quite like that, actually, because, you know, it's messy. You know, on the one hand, we have what's presented to us in the world through consciousness, which is kind of tactile and, and visual. And it's kind of amalgam of all these different things. Uh, but then the back, which we don't usually see, is all the kind of neurophysiology behind it. And we're still guessing about this. We're still trying to uh, picture this. You know, uh, there are people that are talking about kinesthesia and proprioception and whether, you know, there is such a thing as a somatic sense or a muscle sense. This is kind of a historical argument that isn't, you know, completely resolved, I, I have to say. So, you know, the idea of touch actually is, is very expansive, I'll say. Uh, I think that's, that's basically a way to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Annabelle says something here, and I, th I think sh maybe Shirin or Amina can, she said that I also once read, the void is silence, but not empty. Silence is a language itself. Would you have comments of these two thoughts I read? So Annabelle says that. I don't know if Shirin or Amina wants to answer this, because I think this is kind of related to what you, are, uh, you said about your artworks. And before that, sorry, she said, I once I read books are containers of secrets and metaphors. Therefore, it is not the aesthetic of the book, but for what the book itself means. And then she keeps with like the void is silent, but not empty. Silence is a language itself. Shirin John, do you want to talk about? Because I know, yeah, you work on this concept a lot and we see that in your works. Do you want to talk about this? Yeah, well, um, I think actually the the maybe the, the approach uh, Amir Parsa was uh, was having at the beginning of of of, um, of his words about the way we uh, we we get to the books and uh, what what is the meaning of the books for us? I think. Um, what Annabelle says is very related because it's like this object we get to that uh, it's like the, the opening of, of a universe for us. No? So it's like, um, actually it, it's, it's what the content of the book, uh, it's, it's, it's like full of metaphors. And uh, actually it's like, a, for me, maybe it's, it's again, going back to the, the idea of the hidden thing, no? So it's when you when you open it, I think she wants to talk about this. No, it's not about only, for example, I'm thinking now about uh, Amina's books. No, even they are the, the, the image I've seen with the four books. No, even you cannot open them, but uh, there's a tension, like a very poetical tension about the closing thing. No, so actually me as a spectator, what I would like to do is to open them and to read them, but that is not possible. And something, there's a physical tension that maybe you can take it to the like more pro poetical or metaphorical perspective now. So I think that um, taking you back to the idea of silence or void, it, uh, it can make more sense. Um, I don't know if Annabelle wanted, like was thinking about this, but, uh, um well well the 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 the, um, the idea of the concepts of secrets or the, the the concealing well it's very huge so i think maybe i don't know maybe amina wants to add anything else i think you you expressed already reading the book by um by your observation of the stacking and description of it, that was that was reading it in itself. Um, I, I I like the fact that you you know you wanted to engage deeper and want to open the book as well, and I think that's our need to know something further. Um, I I wanted to also say that it takes time. I think it takes time for us to. Uh, from opening or seeing something, touching it, it might take moments, days, years before we actually then digest that thing that we actually read or understood. Uh, it's not an immediate thing. And we're always in a hurry uh, to, 
you know, to read something. I think it's, it, it takes time um, to do that. that. That's all. And we can, we're the container. We are the container. <laughs> okay, because we just talked about this hidden and uh, not showing everything as Shirin always says. So uh, Mark, would you want to add, I think we talked about, I think in the interview, we talked about that Amina's work, that they are placed in sealed cases and we have only like a tactile experience. How we, how is the process of perception and understanding where the sense of sight is not involved at all? It's just through the sense of touch. How these things are connected and then we understand it or we think that we understand it? Yeah, yeah, that, absolutely. Um, so actually it kind of follows on from, from what I was saying before in that you know this, this idea of touch is like a, an amalgam of different things. When you look at technologies of touch, especially with like blindness. Blindness is one of the kind of paradigmatic examples of you know, an absence of vision. And therefore in literature, at least, you know, it, it becomes a, like a truism um, about a deepening of the sense of touch. This is a, a kind of trope in literature and, and film as well. Um, and there's some kind of evidence for that, actually. I found that you know, there, is, there are some labs, Pasquale Leone, for example, who has looked at how actually aspects of the visual cortex get repurposed when you learn braille, but actually sighted people have real difficulty uh, learning braille. And so, but your acuity for learning braille increases when you're blindfolded. And so actually there's some kind of uh, plasticity in evidence in terms of, you know, reallocating aspects of the visual cortex, which is a huge chunk of the brain uh, to tactile perception and acuity and kind of more fine grained um, fidelity of touch as well. So there's that kind of, uh, there's that going on in the brain itself, but also outside of the brain, you know, when you think of like cybernetics and, and Norbert Wiener, you know, he's, he talks a lot about, you know, um, offloading some of the con contents of perception and cognition outside of the brain, like a, an artificial cortex he, he talks about, which is kind of rather dramatic. Uh, <laughs> but there are these things, these uh, technologies like sensory substitution technologies in which the sense of touch stands in for the sense of sight. And so I've actually tried one of these and I wrote about it in my book um, about blindness and um, they're very cool. It's, it's kind of quite fun. And you put on a little camera uh, on some glasses and uh, it feeds in an optical um, information and it outputs as a pattern of electrical stimulus on the tongue, like an array on the tongue. And the, the Mexican American neuroscientist who did this, Paul Bakirita, initially, I mean, he tried uh, like on the stomach first and then on the back. And the first one of these uh, machines was, uh, it's called a tactile visual sensory substitution system. The first one of these machines was basically a repurposed dentist's chair, which was huge and mobile. And there was a camera on a tripod looking at very kind of basic shapes on the screen and then imprinting these patterns on the back. So it's kind of touch and it's kind of um, embossing <laughs> and print. It's kind of printing on the back, but then somehow the brain reinterprets this uh, in a visual form. And so there's, there's a process of um, acclimatization uh, with repeated exposure to this in which eventually uh, you will kind of see, but you know, various philosophers have been talking about this. You know, this is, um, you know, people writing about extended cognition and, and so on. The senses are kind of being rediscovered in philosophy again. And they're kind of wondering, well, you know, is this really touch? Um, so it's kind of inverted commas. Uh, sorry, is this really seeing? Uh, this is kind of inverted commas. Um, and, you know, from my very limited experience, because um, I'm not blind, and I did try, you know, the, the head-mounted version in the, and the tongue, uh, it, it w there was this capacity to reach and touch and bring objects closer and perceive in a way that you know, wasn't either seeing or touch. It was kind of in between. So again, actually through the technology and through the brain, um, you know, it, I think everything's up for grabs as it were to use another haptic metaphor. And the other thing though, is that, you know, in, in the conversation we've, uh, people have been talking about, you know, the physical book versus the digital and so on. And 
I've got to say that one of the philosophers that I have most admired and was kind of uh, very pleased to meet uh, a couple of times actually is Alfonso Lingis. And uh, he was at the University of Pennsylvania and he's written about phenomenology and travel and encounters with the other. He uses Levinas and Merleau-Ponty and he's a really lovely chap. And he's the kind of chap, he's kind of in his late eighties now and he just goes off around the world. He's never really at his home in Maryland. And one day I said to him, but you know, you must travel with such a huge collection of books. You know, your luggage must be really heavy. And this is a man, you know, who's in his eighties and, you know, a philosopher and he loves his Kindle. He loves just electronic books. So I was <laughs> very surprised about that. And I don't think I would love the electronic book quite as much. I think partly because, you know, we, when we talk about secrets and voids and metaphors, for example, you know, there is the idea of, you know, unpacking a library, of touching a book that we've read many times before. And just in the same way that um, it's The Go-Between by L.P. Hartley, the novel, The Go-Between. And very early on in that novel, which is about kind of forbidden love, uh, the young boy, the, the narrator as a young boy, remembers going up to the attic and going to a great big suitcase and um, flipping open the, uh, the locks. And suddenly, with the release of the locks, without even opening the suitcase, there's a kind of flood of memory. It's a kind of involuntary memory that comes along, just triggered through like a simple haptic activity. Um, and personally, I, I have had the same experience with, you know, with books, but also I discovered the other day floppy disks, right? Three and a half inch floppy disks that I'd completely forgotten about and kind of dusted down and just wonder whether they work or something. And I kind of flood a memory of, you know, when I was an undergraduate student and those little Apple classic Macs and so on uh, with the black and white screens, all kinds of things. I mean, all kinds of things. So, you know, these kind of the power of touch, but also um, Kindles and electronic devices that's actually kind of flattening quite a lot of this experience. I'm not sure we'll have the same experience if we take out a Kindle, but maybe we will. Maybe we'll dust down those Kindles and not actually be able to access the books inside them, but have all these kind of haptic memories, you know, the warmth of the sun on the beach when you were reading Maurice Merleau-Ponty, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to talk more about the, what you said, the memory and the power of touch. Uh, I usually say I'm, still, I'm, I'm an old fashioned. I still would prefer like the actual book. And it has that. I mean, it's something it's more than that. Even if when I read it, it, I'm not done with that book. That's part of my memory. But with the experience of like online digital books, as you said, it's kind of a flatterness experience. Is that how you mentioned? So it's, then I will miss that. Maybe that's my experience. I don't know. But I would like, I don't know, maybe any of you, Amijan, do you want to add anything on that? Because you like make books, you I mean, write books, yeah. Sure. I mean, just uh, the, the thing you just said, Nadia, made me think of, so you said, um, you know, I miss this, but maybe the Kindle. But I think what we're, what, what's happening here sometimes is that we're assuming that you kind of write the same kinds of things, you write the same kind of ways, you think the same kind of way in terms of writing, in terms of the uses of language and poetic uses of language and philosophical uses of language on these different platforms and mediums, right? And obviously you could, we have, right? We just transfer one to the other. But I think what's interesting is how you can use the parameters that are specific in terms of exploration and exploitation on these different platforms. So the physical versus, versus the digital in this case, in order to create a different experience for the potential reader, right? So let me go back to Shirin. When, when she's creating these very particular works using this material, she's creating a very specific, you know, unique experience where you connect to the nature of language, the nature of reading, and you can't help but do that. So, so the work, it beautifully invites you and imposes you to think about that, right? And I, th I think by thinking through the material and thinking through the objecthood, um, you can create different types of things. So whether it's uh, creating the uh, illusion of a book like Mahman does, right? Um, or these particular um, things 
like uh, you know Masume and, and Shirin and Amina, where you're really re connecting to um, the reading phenomenon and thus language and thus form and thus our connection to the world through these things. I think this is where you know this is where I'm getting is that we can use. Um, and there's many, many, many different parameters that we haven't explored, right? I'll, one simple parameter, I, I saw someone on, on the chat say, we've been trained to open books, Bonnie Epstein. We've been trained to open books, so we assume that a book must be opened in order to be read, right? So right there, you could almost take that concept and play with it in many ways, whether from a literary perspective, the philosophical, whoever, however you define yourself to actually play with that concept, but in a very meaningful way. You create something that you can't open or you can partly open or like Amina is doing, you don't even open, but you only touch, you can't see. So I think to me, what's interesting is not to, um, I, I think in a way I agree with Mark also, I think the day will come where we'll dust off the Kindle and feel bad, you know, all the memories of those times with the Kindle will come back. I think it's inevitable, right? Because the objects through which we experience and through which we build memories are going to be different. You know, TikTok one day might be such an old thing, but the, for the 12 and to 16 year olds who are have so many memories attached to it, you know, 20 years from now, it'll be, oh, those TikTok days, right? Um, but so I think that is absolutely true. But at the same time, I think that, uh, no, it's not but. Um, and at the same time, I think what we can do is really think that all these overtures and the use, singular use of the possibilities in each of these mediums and materials is very akin to singular use of language. Like if you're writing in Farsi, you don't want to write something that you can similarly write in English. You want to use the, the singularities of that language to create something. So I think the same can hold true if you're working to write something that is printed many times over and disseminated in the same way to 2,000 people and think differently if you're making an object that's appearing in a gallery and think differently if you're doing something in the digital realm where you can use the, the very unique parameters of that realm to create something unique. So I don't think, Mariam, you should think only, oh my God, I'm going to like miss this and that. You should, you know, there's the singularity that each one can have. And that's what I think, um, you know, the artists and the writers and the philosophers can really like explode with in the future. Thank you. Can so, I jump in here, Mary? Sure. Um, I just wanted to um, take this a little bit further because it reminded me of a conversation that I was having with my family about uh, all the different processes of reading throughout time and uh, using the floppy disks and cassettes and all of that sort of st materials. And then going back to how we have the tablet again, you know, we started with the tablet, you know, and now we're going back to the tablet. And then my daughter was concerned with um, the number of hours children are spending five to six hours in front of the computer, you know, reading material. And she uh, proposed a challenge that children should be put in front of a stone for five hours to see what happens. And I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> Wouldn't that be abuse? Wouldn't social services be involved? Well, you know, then which one is abuse? Is the computer abusive? You know, are we abusing the children by doing that? Uh, sit sitting them in front of a white wall, a stone, what? what is going to challenge their imagination more? Uh, the, the material that is visibly placed in front of them and telling them what to do or the one that draws something out of them? Thank you. So I'm reading this, uh, Elizabeth asked about like uh, the structural role of the spine, like the physical book, and for example, or the bindings, or how one of the artists, Bahman, just disconnected. I hope he is, uh, he'll be back soon. Uh, how, for example, Bahman binds his book. So um, I can, so Bahman, as, as we said, it's not a book, it's just a, a, a like object that looks like books. So there's no binding involved. And I think this is something about this show that some of the artists actually use, for example, Masume used book as a source 
And also she makes this book or, for example, Bahman just use like the concept of the book. So it's not necessarily about like the structure of the book, at least in this exhibition. Um, and then uh, books, non-electronic books of any kind will be accessible years from now. But ebooks and other such books will be inaccessible years from now because their technology will be absolute. Any comments on this? Yeah, can I just say about the spine? I mean, that's that's kind of an interesting question. Sure. Um, yeah, I, because uh, so I, I'm not, I won't speak for Bachmann uh, at all, um, but just actually, uh, you know, the spine is, is um, you know, when we're talking about the threads and we're talking about, you know, sewing the pages together. And so the, the spine of the book and you know the neurological uh, kind of metaphor as well. The spine is you know where a lot of things are happening. And uh, actually, my estimation for what um, surgeons do in terms of you know with broken backs, for example, has just gone out of the charts because so much of you know reflex and uh, movement is actually coordinated through the spine as well. And I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, I'm a completely different type of doctor, uh, obviously. Uh, but I just in reading uh, early 20th century uh, uh, neurophysiological kind of treatises by like Charles Sherrington, for example, and systems of reflex, uh, the spine is absolutely a lot where it's at. And um, on the one hand, when we think about the extension, like the tactile extension, so prosthesis, let's think about prosthesis for a second. When we think about putting an artificial arm um, or leg, uh, and extending the, the feeling of the body and then reshaping the body image to you know, a new limb or like a replaced limb, for example. Um, th there's been some kind of research at, at my university, University of Pittsburgh, uh, with uh, implants, so brain computer interface uh, stuff. So um, deep brain stimulation that uh, open, open brain surgery and uh, inserting these um, like, um, uh, panels that uh, that uh, cause electrical stimulation in the brain, and so trying to kind of map the the various cortices of the brain in order for a paraplegic uh, person to shake the hand of Obama, which is what happened in 2016 when he came to visit the University of Pittsburgh. And I wasn't actually there; I didn't see the handshake, but this this was in the press and everything. And and that was actually one of the kind of uh, that's the opening chapter of the new book. Actually, is is thinking about you know. Uh, having a handshake through a prosthetic arm. But very, very recently, actually, there's been a new method which actually gets into the spine as well and actually implants directly into the spine to do the work of coordinating the muscles and the uh, movements of the arms and legs as well. And I, so I think the spine is absolutely like when we're thinking Michelle Serre or when we're thinking of, of you know, the, the messiness of uh, neurophysiology and, and blood and fibers uh, and so on, or maybe the actual act of, of binding the, the pages together. The spine is kind of, it's really central. I mean, I know it's, uh, it's, obvious, it's obvious and yet not obvious at the same time, right? Um, yeah. Thank you. The body, the body, the body. It's always there. Yes, and that's that was I think I asked this like uh, from Mark like if we imagine if we see ourselves in the future uh, in a world that actually these technologies can exactly simulate the sense of touch for us not only the cutaneous form but also for example i don't know i put a uh, goggles or something and i feel like i'm in a place but again this is a question about our body how we can get close to that you know <laughs> or should we expect it or not so in, in my case uh the, one of the things that we've talked about before mariam and that um I'm kind of constantly going to conferences and people are, are talking about this type of thing. Um, the potential solutions for a kind of replication of the whole body experience. And there was a, a movie that came out 
uh, a couple of years ago, was it? One year ago, uh, Ready Player One. And that actually caused a, a bit of a sensation in the tech industry because uh, there is the idea that you know, haptic technologies will suddenly be everywhere. It will drive you know, the demand by consumers of haptic technologies. And so uh, what, I don't know who wants this, the military industrial complex wants us all to be you know, wearing virtual reality headsets and feeling that virtual reality world as well. And so you know, the question is, on the one hand, uh, I'm really excited about virtual archeology. span I really want to pick up a virtual hand ax that has not been touched for thousands of years because it's actually modeled in a computer, but also it's the ability to make you know, historical sites come alive again. And that would be tremendously exciting. I mean, yes, I could play Assassin's Creed, but I don't like dying repeatedly and I'm no good at those kind of things and so on. So what about walking and touching and interacting with objects in that kind of way? Fantastic. But uh, on the other hand, um, you know, the cycles of hype and my, my uh, co-collaborator uh, and, and colleague and friend actually, um, David Parisi has kind of just written about a book about the archeologies of touch. And he's been interviewed a number of times actually about, you know, well, where are our haptic technologies? And he says basically where they were, you know, 10 years ago, they're always on the horizon of mass, you know, consumption and acceptability. I mean, let's, let's not forget that in 1932, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, which um, actually partly plagiarized Evgeny um, Yematsev's book, We, I think. But anyway, uh, Brave New World, you know, talks about, you know, an erotic scene in, in the, the feelies, instead of the movies, the feelies. And that was a kind of um, fantasy of the future, which you know things come alive. You can you can feel the fur on the bearskin rug in the love scene of that feely instead of movie, the feely. And you know it's how many years later? It's it's 70, 80, Oh my goodness, it's quite a long time. It's ninety years afterwards. <laughs> wow. And uh, we're no closer to that really. I mean, apart from in very special applications of the technology. Um, where, for example, for design and uh, computer-aided design and so on, you can model uh, high-fidelity textures using a kind of desktop interface. But apart from that, we're, you know, there are stabs at this, but it's, it's not a very high-fidelity touch. And the other thing then is, you know, what happens to museums and what happens to galleries? And, and clearly, you know, well, Google would like us to visit the Google Art and Exhibitions um, part of their vast empire. And we interact through a screen and we can have a walk through past paintings or something. And that's just clearly not good enough. And what is most horrifying and tantalizing is that we're talking, like all of us are talking about these books that I am craving to see close by. And by see, I mean actually touch and hold and turn the pages or at least go up to close enough because some of yours like Shirin, for example, I don't want to touch that at, at all. I would, don't want to, you know, the, the fragile beauty of that and the inscriptions and so on. I need to see it up close and I'm not going to be able to. And that is uh, uh, not until I fly to New York and um, expose myself to all kinds of things. I'm, I'm in Scotland now, by the way, I'm not, I'm not in Pittsburgh. So yeah, I'm further away. Uh, so uh, it is, it's kind of cruel what you're doing to us, actually, by letting us talk about this and, and see the, this and have presentations on this, when actually the touching of them would be, uh, I so look forward to, to, to experiencing that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would, I don't know how many of the participants are in New York, but I would encourage everyone if you are in the city to see, because of course it's a complete different experience when you are in the place. One other thing that we talked about, uh, Mark, if you remember, I was talking about like uh, at exhibitions, part of the curator's job is to design the show. What is the conversations between the works? When I step in the gallery, what is the first work that I see? And what does that give, like what feeling or what, I don't know, uh, um, effect it has on me or like what is on the right on the left uh, should I like install it uh, like above the eye under the all of this this is part of our job too about the perception how the audience perceive and understand 
And we were talking that if you think about this online exhibition, even though if you have like the best qualities, everything, this is the first thing that I think we miss. We miss the conversation of between the works and everything in just images, images, images. Um, I think uh, I was going to ask Amir about uh, something. Uh, ask you, Amir, about like we. I think we talked about this that uh, if we if we agree and we see that these printed books are being replaced with e-books, what do you see the artist book in the future? I I personally I think these could be like the alternatives for book in terms of tactile experience. So at least if we go to galleries, we can touch, we can have this experience maybe only <laughs> through the artist books. I don't know. I don't know how far is that, that we don't have any printed books. Yeah, I, but... <laughs> I, I, um, just to answer your question and also uh, the, the question you had asked before, which was, that the digital books will be obs like obsolete because the technology changes. But I don't think that anything becomes radically obsolete, right? Maybe the audience goes down, you become, you have niches of people still embracing it to a certain extent. It's true, obviously, certain technologies will be more produced at mass level, more people will consume a very specific type of thing, right? Uh, but I wanna take that example that, that the chat um, comments that you you said that you talked about with books printed books still being accessible, but the ebooks becoming obsolete because of their technology, which is counter to what a lot of people think, right? But again, so to me, I think there's a lot of nuance there. Number one, I don't think all printed books will be accessible because a lot of them will not be reprinted. A lot of them will not be placed in the libraries that won't exist, right? Um, also, you have to really think about the chain. So we'll, we won't have certain types of writing, certain types of thinkings ever printed because the chain will not allow, you know, you, you don't think in the same way anymore. We, we all, probably everybody here grew up like in terms of our views of the world and our relationship to language through books, right? But that's changing. So we won't have certain things. So what I wanted to say there was that, um, and it relates to your question, is that certain books will be accessible. Certain types of writings on different types of material will be accessible, which is what you're talking about. What if this type of creation can actually be very conscious that it's an alternative to the printed book? So, and this is what I've you know, done, like, like you're saying, um, just being very, um, cognizant that I wanted to actually create limited edition literary works, right? Um, I, I did a couple of things where I placed rocks and in Vermont, there's rocks with writings on them because like the person is saying, you can always go. Or you, uh, I put rocks with writings on them at the bottom of a lake and the water washed away the writing right away, whereas a rock, rock next to it uh, stays. But what you could do if you wanted to do a digital war, uh, piece and you're worried about it, or you think it might become obsolete, what if you took into account the fact that that thing is gonna be obsolete and write a particular kind of thing that you can't on the rock or in printed work, whether it's political or whether it's gibberish or whatever, right? So again, I come back to the point I keep, that to me is very relevant, is that you can use the different statuses, the different dimensions, the different experiences that one can have um, by creating uh, through the through the singularities um, and and create those alternatives that you're talking about because all those alternatives are there we have a multiplicity of them now granted again at the mass level some things will be consumed more but I think this multiplicity and the way it allows us to think and write and create and construct while creating new categories of objects and experiences is what's really um, enriching and fascinating. Thank you. Okay, it's 2.33. Uh, let me see. So Stacy says, printed book as a human mark making, human mark making is important. We can say that like art about artists, but printed books, artworks, all of them. Uh, and Masumajan, a question for you. 
yeah, maybe if you can have like very quick, uh, your work requires a lot of uh, concentration and precision. Do the empty spaces holes have also a meaning, a role, like windows to the next page, the empty spaces in the origami books, do they have any meanings for you? Um, it's not a windows of the next page. Uh, let me to um, explain more about uh, origami's books and how um, I make them. Uh, Mariam John, could you please um, project the beginning of my slideshow? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sure, give me a second. Okay, Masuma. The process, right? The making yeah, yeah. process, okay. Let me just share my screen. First of all, I make origami a step by a step, and then I take a photos of each step. I use these photos in Photoshop uh, for creating the map of cutouts based on the lines. Uh, then uh, these maps help me to create a, a essential for each page of the books. I mean, I keep the lines and cut the geometric shapes. Um, so when you um, open the book and go to the next page, the form will be changed and it's always creates new image to your mind. Uh, but all these changing um, are the process of making the final object in origami. I don't know if it's complex or not. I mean, it's a... Thank and you. <laughs> yeah, as you see, I'm going to show this again. They'll change page by page. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Does anyone want to add anything else? Masume Bahman Amir. Is Mark here or? Okay. Okay, thank you everyone again. Thank you for joining us. It was great. And thank you all of you, Shirin, Amine, Amir, Mark is not here, Masume and Bahman. And there is a, uh, so if you if you want to uh, read more uh, or see the images, as Jenna said, you can go to the web center's website and order the catalog online. I was planning to show you uh, like the images of the catalog, but uh, I thought it could be maybe distractive during our conversation, but you, if you can go and order the catalog online and please uh, stay in touch and check out the other programs for Amina and Shirin, Shirin's masterclass and Amina's collaborative workshop. Thank you everyone Thank you. and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.